I had decided that we would do something on calculus. So I found these questions. Um, I, they are just slightly more difficult than the stuff that we've done previously. But these are typical exam questions. This is the sort of thing that you, you can expect to see on Friday in your exam as well. Okay, all right, so let's, let's jump into it without wasting any more time. In 9.1, they've given us the graph of g of x equals x cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d is sketched below. Then they tell us the graph of G intersects the X axis at minus five and zero and at P and the Y axis at zero and 20. P and R are turning points of G. So straight away, before we even look at the questions, all right, do we know the value of one of the letters that's missing? Just based on the information that's given here, we're not even gonna look at the questions yet, but do we know the value of one of the letters that's missing? Have they told us? Yes, good Fahin, good Spasiklia, quite right. They've told us that D is equal to 20. So we know that. The other bit of information that they've given us, which is a little bit more subtle, all right, is that they've also told us the coefficient of the X cubed term. We don't have to calculate it. They've told us what it is. What is the coefficient of the X cubed term? What are they implying it's equal to? So the coefficient of the X cubed term, what are they telling us it's equal to? Absolutely. Okay, good, Ntebukheng. Yes, Naledi. 100%, they're telling us it's equal to one. So in front of X cubed, there's an invisible positive one. And that explains the shape of the function that we see in front of us. So at first it's concave down and then it is concave up. Okay, so R and P represent the turning points. The other thing that I want to chat about a little bit before we actually move on and look at the questions is point P. What is special about P? What can you tell me about P? <clears throat> sure. Okay. So then that makes it what, Diana? Yeah, 100%. So it's an x-intercept. Yes, lovely. Yes, lovely, lovely. It's an x-intercept. And it's, thank you, to Interbuching. It is a turning point. Okay. So it's two things at the same time. A turning point. Yeah, there's no gradient there. Gradient is equal to zero. So yes, very important. It's a turning point. And it is also an x-intercept. What happens to our equation for uh, a cubic function when we have an x-intercept that's also a turning point? What do we see if we were if we had factorized our cubic polynomial, our cubic expression for the for the function? What what would we notice? I know this is a little bit more difficult, the question that I'm asking you here. And Tebuchen, go for it. Unmute and talk. Um, Ma'am, I tried writing it. It takes a long time. So the turning point will have a squared. There so we go. Sorry, Tebuchen, keep talking. Oh, oh, the whole equation. No, 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 no. Just keep saying what you were saying about the squared. Oh, yeah, so it's the same as instead of 3x, I think it's minus 1 or x plus 1, x plus like um, the, you know, it will it will be two brackets, but the last one will be you subbing the, the turning point and it will have a squared. It will have a squared oh, on it. That's P and a squared, yes. Lovely. And Tebukheng, I could not have said that better. I'm so pleased that you were able to um, pick up on that so quickly. So what Tebukheng is getting at, just for the rest of us, is this, okay? Remember, when we have a cubic function, it takes the form y equals a x minus x1, x minus x2, x minus x3. That's if we have three distinct different roots, 
okay? But here, because at P, this is a turning point and it is an x-intercept, what is going to happen is that one of these brackets is going to be squared. So in other words, what we would end up with is y equals a x minus x1. And then here we'd have x minus x2, but this bracket would be squared. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Okay, so... And the squared bracket is the one where the, it's an x-intercept and it is also a turning point. Okay, so that's really, really important to know as well. Okay, and I'm sure now that we've spoken about it, um, it, it must be coming back to you if your teacher told you this, which I'm sure they must have done. Okay, so now that we know sort of pretty much what it is that we're looking at, let's go and see what the questions ask us. Well, the first one asks us to show that B is one, C is minus 16, and D is 20. Now, specifically, you told us that D was 20 right at the beginning, okay? So that's really nice that you knew that, and I think Dion and you also knew that as well. So that's great, okay? So when they tell us to show that, it means we are not allowed to sub in the information that they've given us. We have to get those answers and pretend like we didn't know that those were the answers. Right. So of the two equations that are on the board, which is going to be the one that we're going to use in this situation? Are we going to use the first one or are we going to use the second one? Hello, Antoizo. Absolutely, Valerie. Okay, we've got to use the second one. Yes, in Tebogheng, we've got to use the second one. We do, we do, we do. Now, the problem is we don't know what the value of P is. So in order to be able to show that um, B is 1 and C is minus 16 and D is 20, we need to know, mind you, do we? It says they calculate the coordinates of P and R. <clears throat> we need to know what that value is because I mean, we're going to have to multiply everything out. So I would say we need to know what P is in order to be able to answer this particular question. Okay, so if we've decided that's it, we're going to use the second one, all right, which is perfect. How are we going to substitute in here? What are we going to write? What are we going to put in place? Or, or can we do it a different way? Let's see. What are our options? The other thing that we could do is this. We could say that y equals, we know that a is equal to 1. They've told us that. So we know that this is 1. Um, then we could write x cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus 20. So we could also solve for B and C simultaneously. Which two points? Actually, can we? I don't think we can because we've already subbed this point in over here. <clears throat> All right, so I think we're going to have to do it the other way. We're going to have to put in the minus 5. All right, so normally when we solve simultaneously, we would have uh, two points that we would be able to sub in. So we've already subbed this one in. And if we make x equal to zero, then obviously it's going to make the b and the c cancel. So actually doing it that way does not help us in this situation. We're going to have to go and do it the first way. All right. So let's go ahead and go and sub in here. So we would end up with y equals, remember, a is equal to one. And then here we would have x plus five. And then here we would have x minus. And I'm just going to use the p all right, as my x-intercept, and that's going to be squared. Uh, do I now have another point that I can sub in? Yes, I've got the y-intercept of 0 and 20. So I can say 20 is equal to 0 plus 5, 0 minus p squared. So this is going to end up giving me 20 equals, and of course, 0 minus p squared would give me p squared. So I would end up here with 5p squared. Does that make sense to everybody? Are we all good?
Are we all good? Okay, all right, now we're gonna divide both sides by five. So B squared is gonna be equal to four. So either P is going to be equal to negative two or it's gonna be equal to positive two. All right, so now we've got to make a choice. Is P equal to negative two or is it equal to positive two? Absolutely, 100% it would be positive two, quite right. Okay, so now what we're ready to do is we are ready to go and sub back in. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sub our P into this line over here. So we're gonna end up with this. We're gonna end up with, let's write on this side over here, Y equals X plus five times X, and then this would be minus two in brackets squared. Does that make sense to everybody? And then, good, good, I'm glad. And then what we could do is keep our x plus 5 on the outside, square our binomial, so x squared minus 4x plus 4. And now we can finally get rid of the two brackets. So that would give us x cubed minus 4x squared plus 4x, plus 5x squared. Um, where were we? Minus 20x, and then the last term would be plus 20. So now we end up with y equals x cubed. Minus 4x squared plus 5x squared would give us 1x squared. 16 minus 20 would give us minus 16x, and then we would bring down our plus 20. Okay, and hence we have shown that b is 1 and c is minus 16 and d is 20. Yes, Fahim, what's your question? Uh, Ma'am, can I would like you to explain this first question to me again, please. It's okay, all right. All right, that's fine. I'm happy to go. I'm happy to go through it again because I do realize that this is a little bit difficult. With this particular question, Fahim, do you understand that because the P is a turning point and an x-intercept, that the bracket with a P in it would be squared? Do you know that? Yes. You know. Um, that? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, all right. So then what I've done is I've gone and subbed in my negative five. So a minus minus five gives me plus five. That's this point over here. And then I've gone and subbed in my y-intercept. Remember my x is zero, mm -hmm. whilst my y is 20. That means that only the letter P is missing. So what I've done is I've now gone and solved for the value of that x-intercept and that turning point. So I'm multiplying the brackets together. Mm -hmm. Remember, 0 minus p is going to be negative p. And when we square it, it's going to be p squared mm -hmm. times 5 is equal mm -hmm. to 20. Divide both sides by 5. And that means that p squared would be equal to 4. Mm -hmm. OK, and then I'm taking the square root on both sides and I'm saying, well, either P can be equal to negative two or P can be equal to positive two. Because P is on the positive X axis, it would be equal to positive two. But when we go and sub into our formula, OK, so in other words, this formula over here, these are minuses. So mm -hmm. if you sub in a negative number, you end up with a plus. And if you sub in a positive number, you're going to end up with a minus. minus. Mm. Okay, so I've taken the two from here and I've subbed it in over there and then I haven't forgotten that I need to square it. Okay, makes sense. Okay, and then I've squared my binomial, I've multiplied my uh, trinomial with my x plus five and it's given me the answers that I'm looking for. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so no. much. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Bonolo, do you want to ask a question? Go for it.
Um, my, my question is, how do we know that the 4x switches from a negative into a positive? Because the 4x, yeah. are you talking are you talking about um, the writing in the red and the second line? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so because, because you have a minus in that bracket, what's going to end up happening is this. Let me just go down, um, down here. Okay, so if I've got x minus 2 and I square it, remember it means x minus 2 times x minus 2. So when we do our FOIL, we're going to end up with x squared minus 2x minus 2x plus four. So that's why we end up with a negative middle negative. term and a positive last term. Yeah. Okay, so it will, it will always be like that if you are squaring a binomial with a negative in it. Okay, this middle term here will always be negative. Yes. If you're squaring a binomial that has a plus in the middle, then all the terms will be positive. Yes. Okay. My question is, why does it, when it gets to the other line, the third line, it's positive, it's no more negative? That's my question. You see? Where, where is it positive? Uh, minus 4x squared plus 4x. Okay, but, but this 4x over here, oh, oh, this yes, 4x yes. here is not that one there. Remember oh. this term over here, this, we multiplied these two together to get this term. Oh, I this see. plus 4x is the x times 4. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. okay. You see, it's not, Thank it's you. not, I understand now why you're oh. asking, but it's, yeah, it's because it's not the same term. Oh, no, I see. It. Now you see, okay, Benola, no problem. No problem. Um, and then, Ntokoza, you were also asking something in the chat. Let me just go and have a look. Okay, so into causal, the way that it works is like this, all right? When you have got a cubic function that has a turning point that is also an x-intercept, that value of x, when you sub it into your bracket, will always have a square on it. That's just the way that it works out, okay, when, one, when that value is an x-intercept and a turning point. Okay, so that's something that you can you can learn and you can always use. It always works like that with cubic functions. Okay, so that's why we put the square on the bracket with the P in it. Okay, yeah, so that's something you just have to learn. It's just one of the characteristics of the cubic function. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, so we have found the equation of the cubic function and we are now ready to move on to the next question where they ask us to calculate the coordinates of P and R. All right, so P and R are the turning points. So what are we gonna use to find the coordinates at the turning points? What do we do? What do we have to use? We have to use the first derivative, absolutely. We have already worked P out quite right. Yep, absolutely, first derivative. Okay, first derivative. So what are we gonna do with our first derivative? We're gonna make it equal to? What are we gonna make our first derivative equal to? We're gonna make it equal to zero and we must show that because at the turning point, the gradient is? zero that's why we do that okay 100 and you must 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 show that step all right so now we're going to go f prime x and we're going to derive and we're going to end up with 3x squared plus 2x minus 16 if i've done things correctly Okay, so we've taken the equation of our cubic function and we have now derived it. So if you cannot do question 9.1.1, that's why the question has been set out the way that it has, where it says show that. Because what's happening is that you're being given that information so that if you can't do 9.1.1, you can still do 9.1.2 and 9.1.3. Okay, so if you see something like that and you're not sure what to do, 
don't let it throw you. Don't just say, well, I can't do the entire question now. Try and do as much of every question that you possibly can. All right, so <clears throat> it's better for you to lose four marks and get the other eight than to lose all the marks in this question just because you couldn't do 9.1.1. Okay, so you are allowed to use that information and answer the rest of the questions. Okay, so if you need to do it, then do it. So we've derived, we've made it equal to zero, not yet. Okay, that's something that we're going to get a mark for. So make sure that you show that. Okay, exactly what I'm writing over here. This is exactly what you must show um, on your page as well. And now either we can use the quadratic formula or we can factorize. Okay, I'm going to try and factorize it. Hopefully it does factorize. Uh, let's see what happens. Okay, so um, if I put my eight over here and I put two over there, then I'll get six and eight. So I want plus eight minus two. Okay, so I'm just checking that. That gives me three X squared. Uh, 6x, negative 6x plus 8x gives me plus 2x in the middle, and plus 8 times negative 2 gives me that minus 16 at the end. Or if you want to use the quadratic formula, not a problem. Okay, so x equals negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. All right, and then you'll get the same answer. All right. Okay, so specifically, okay, you're giving us the coordinates at the turning points. All right, no problem. So either x is equal to negative 8 over 3, or x is equal to 2. Well, we certainly expected the answer on the right where x was equal to 2. We knew that that was going to happen. Let's just move this down. Okay, so what we can do now is we can say, well, therefore, the coordinates at P are 2 and 0. I suppose what we should probably do is show that we get 0 as an answer, actually, before we do that. Let's just say <coughs> y equals 2 cubed, what was it, plus one, plus two squared, minus 16 times two plus 20, if I think I got that right, and then we would get y equals zero, so therefore at p the coordinates are two and zero, That's fine, and cause if you want to use the quadratic formula, you are most welcome. You've just got to show that you've subbed into it. So if you use the quadratic formula, you must show what I've written here on the board. Okay, and then of course, guys, if we're subbing in a nasty fraction like minus eight over three, we're going to get a nasty fraction out as our answer. Okay, so we're going to do that, and then we've got to cube it, and then we're going to square it. So remember, we're subbing into the equation from 9.1.1. Minus 16 times negative 8 over 3 plus 20. And Specifle has already worked out the answer. Spare, what did you get? Okay, so Itumulen, you also. Okay, minus 8 over 3 and 1372 over 27. Yeah, 1372 over 27. Well done. Okay, and that's what we would expect a nasty answer like that. 1372 over 27. All right, good job, good job. And remember, if they ask us for coordinates, we must write our answer using coordinates because we don't want to be penalized for anything. And of course, if we look at the signs of our answers, everything makes sense. R is a point in the second quadrant, so we're expecting a negative X and a positive Y. And of course, we were expecting the answer of X equals two as well. Okay, everybody good with that? How are we feeling? Let's just check in with you guys. And send us an emoji. Is everything making sense? Everybody happy?
Cool. Cool. Awesome, guys. Good, Richard Say. Good, Kamchelo. Okay, Diana, you want me to go down? Down there. Okay, so Bernola, where do we get the first derivative from? We get it from the equation. Okay, so remember in 9.1.1, we got the equation. All right, so what I was doing, um, Diana, I'm just going back up again just to show Bernola where I got it from. I got it from here, Bernola. So this was, remember, that was my answer for 9.1.1. Okay, so that's what I was deriving in order to get what I have over here. Okay. All right, you're done writing. Okay. Oh, I'm so glad for him. That's great. That's brilliant. Okay, so those are marks that we want you guys to get. Okay, we want you to have nine out of nine so far. Now, the next question is a little bit more difficult. Here they're asking us a question about concavity, and they're saying to us, is the graph concave up or concave down at 0 and 20? Show all your calculations. Okay, so uh, in Kateko, we put our x's again, the, the blue one that I underlined for Bonolo. Okay, the original function. So this one over here that I'm just underlining in blue again, that's where you sub in your x's into your original cubic function. Okay, so in other words, the answer to 9.1.1. Okay, so remember here, we ended up with y equals x cubed. And then remember, we showed that b was equal to 1. And we showed that c was equal to negative 16. And we showed that d was equal to 20. That's what you're subbing into. Okay, once you get those x's. All right, to get the corresponding y at the turning point. Okay, in Kateko, good, 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 good. All right, so now back to question 9.1.3. Is the graph concave up or concave down? Now, how would we be able to tell whether something was concave up or concave down? What, what would we be looking Because remember to find the coordinates at the turning point. At the turning point, we know that the gradient is zero, so we use the first derivative. So what would we use for concavity? How do we? There we go. There we go. We use the second derivative for concavity. So the first derivative is about gradient. The second derivative, when we're talking about a, con uh, a cubic function, has to deal specifically with concavity. Now, just like gradient can be zero or positive or negative, so concavity can be zero or positive or negative. So when gradient is positive, we're walking uphill. When gradient is zero, we've reached a turning point. When gradient is negative, it means we're going downhill. Concavity, when something is concave up, the value of its concavity is positive. As it gets closer and closer and closer, to the point of infection, that, con that measure of concavity becomes closer and closer to zero. At, at the point of um, inflection, concavity is zero, and then your measure of concavity becomes negative as the graph becomes more and more concave down. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Cool. No problem. Okay, so what I was trying to get you guys to understand, Benolo and Itumaleng, and I'm sure there are plenty of others um, that don't understand this as well, and I don't mind repeating myself, of course, is that just like gradient, your first derivative can be positive or negative or zero. 
so your concav concavity can be positive or negative or zero. So at the point of inflection, your concavity is zero. At the turning point, your gradient is zero. Okay, so if I am looking at gradient and I'm talking about, and I'm going to put a little pink mark, if I'm talking about that portion, the gradient would be positive, wouldn't it? If I then went past the turning point and now I'm putting a little blue dot, if I was to measure gradient over there, it would be negative. So the same thing happens with concavity. Okay, so um, here, let me just erase this. So this function is first, con ooh, first concave down. All of this is concave down. Okay, so if we were to work out the value of the concavity anywhere here, it would have a negative value. Then it changes. We don't know if it's exactly at 0 and 20, but then it changes, and now it becomes concave up. So now if we were to measure concavity anywhere on the green part, we would be expecting a positive answer. All right, so concave up is a positive measure of concavity, just like when a, a gradient is positive. All right, and concave down would have a negative value, just like when something is a decreasing function, it has a negative gradient. Okay, at the point of inflection, concavity is equal to zero. Okay, at the turning points, gradient is equal to zero. All right, but now they're asking us, they're not telling us that zero and 20 is the point of inflection. They're asking us, all right, where, what is the graph doing at zero and 20? Is it concave up or is it concave down? So we need to be able to use the zero and 20 to work out the value of the concavity at that point. So in order to be able to work out the concavity, we have to take the second derivative. So we've already got the first derivative over here. So we can just work from there. But mind you, I suppose with us being here online, it's a little bit more difficult. So let me just write down what the first derivative is. It was what? 3x squared minus two, plus 2x minus 16. Why am I writing 20, guys? Plus 2x minus 16. I'm just going to make double sure that I've got that right. 3x squared plus 2x minus 16. Absolutely. That's our first derivative. So now we need to take the second derivative. So we're deriving again. This is going to give us 6x plus two. <clears throat> the point of inflection, incidentally, could be calculated if we made the second derivative equal to zero. So we can work out what the point of inflection actually is. So 6x plus two, I'm going to take the 6x over to the other side. So minus 6x is equal to two, and I'm going to divide both sides by negative six. And that means that x, let's just move this guy down. x would be equal to negative 1 over 3. Ach, get a, sorry, guys. I don't know why my pen does weird things. If on again, just let me just. So x is equal to negative 1 over 3 at the point of inflection. So now we're going to go back and we're going to have a look at what they asked us. Is the graph concave up or concave down at 0 and 20? So we're comparing x's here. Okay, so here it's 0 and 20. Here we've worked out our point of inflection is at minus 103. So what will happen when x is equal to 0? Minus 1 over 3 would be somewhere to the left 
of this point over here, wouldn't it? Okay, it's smaller. Go for it. Um, Ma'am, does the 6x have to be negative? Because if I take the 2 to the other side, then I get 1 over 3 instead of a negative 1 over 3. So if you take the 2 to the other side, then the 2 would be negative, wouldn't it? Oh. Okay. So because remember, if a term goes over to the other side, it has to change its sign, doesn't it? So you'd still oh, get negative okay. 1 over 3. Okay. Um, thank you, ma'am. No problem, no problem. Well, another way that we could do this, of course, is we could test the value of the concavity when x is equal to zero. So here we're going to put in six and then we're going to put in zero and we're going to say plus two. So the value of concavity where x is equal to zero is two. That's positive, means positive two. So therefore the graph would be concave up at 0 and 20. Or I suppose another way that we could do it, like we've already done, is we've said it's equal to minus 103 at the point of inflection. So therefore, it would be concave up at x equals 0. OK, it would be concave up at x equals 0. Does that make sense to everybody? Perseverance, if you want to take the two over to the other side, then the two would end up being negative. Okay, so if you want it as an alternative here, okay, if you've got zero equals six x plus two, if you take this over to the other side, it's going to be negative two equals six x. And you divide by six and you divide by six and you'd still get negative one over three. Okay. Sure. Okay. So where did I, Kinsani, where did I lose you? Oh, good. Come, Khilo. I'm glad. Kinsani, where did I lose you? Okay, so so um, when you are, okay, so Kinsani, look at this, right? We now know that the point of inflection is where x is equal to negative 1 over 3. So if we choose a more negative value than that, like let's say we wanted to work out how concave the function was where x was equal to negative 5. I can take negative 5 and I can sub it into the second derivative. All right, that will tell me how concave down the graph is at that point. Just like if I take negative five and I sub it into the first derivative, it tells me what the gradient is at that point. Okay, so what you will find is that the measure of just like gradient changes, the concavity also changes. So if I sub negative five, for example, into my second derivative, I'm going to get a negative answer. So if I go f prime prime negative five, I'm going to end up with six times negative five plus two. So that would give me negative 28. Now, if I was to take a point where I know that it's positive, like uh, let's say three, look here. Now I'm going to expect my second derivative to be positive. So f prime prime, I'm going to sub in three. So six times three plus two gives me 20. Can you see how the sign of the second derivative is changing? So when it is negative, like it is here, the graph is concave down. This is concave down. And when it's positive, like it is here with a 20, okay, then the graph is concave up. Okay, so what will happen to that negative 28 as we move closer and closer to the point of inflection is that that number will become bigger and bigger until eventually it gets to zero at the point of inflection and then it becomes positive. I think, Jacques, it's actually okay to not work out what the point of inflection was and to test um, 
what the second the value of the second derivative yeah so i think as an alternative so you could do you could do it the way on the left or once you've got your second derivative over here you can go straight there and you can sub in the zero and you can say okay the graph is going to be concave up at that point because the value of the second derivative is positive Okay, so maybe here you could go f prime prime um, x is greater than zero at x equals zero. So the second derivative is positive at x equals zero, therefore the graph is concave up. Does that make sense? Are there any more questions about this question? I think Bonolo had a question. Oh, okay. Bonolo, go for it. Ask a question. I'm still stuck on how we use that cubic uh, equation to get the first derivative. I, that one, I'm still struggling with it. Okay. So, so remember, Bonolo, when you are um, working with the first derivative, you are applying the power rule to every term. So you're multiplying the exponent with the coefficient, and then you're taking one away from the exponent. Do you remember that rule? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so that's what that's what we were doing. Okay. Okay, so in other words, when we went up here, what I was doing is I was taking this three, let me just highlighted i'm taking this three and i'm multiplying it by the invisible one and then i'm taking one away from the exponent that's why i end up with three x squared and then i take two and i multiply it by one and i end up with two x because i've taken one away from the exponent and then i take the one that's sitting on the x and i multiply it with a negative 16. so what i've done here is i've applied the power rule to each term and then when i derive again Bernolo, i'm doing exactly the same thing so i'm saying two times three is six that's where the six here comes from okay all right no problem no problem <laughs> okay so in Koteko, if we get a negative it means we will go to the side where x is negative where the graph will be concave up. So in Kateko, what you are doing, just like you can find the gradient at a point, so you can work out the measure of concavity at a point. So if you are working anywhere, so if your function like this one is first concave down and then concave up, it doesn't matter what value of x you sub in. As long as it's a number that's smaller than a minus a third, you're always going to get a negative value for your um, second derivative. If you sub in a number that is uh, greater than minus 1 over 3, then you're going to get a positive value. And it's going to become more, as x gets bigger, it's going to become more and more positive. As x gets smaller, it's going to be more and more negative. Okay. But that, that's basically the idea behind it. Okay. Okay. All right, so that is that section on the graph over there. All right, so make sure that you can find the equation of a function. Make sure that you can factorize. Lovely. Oh, I'm so good. So glad. Um, make sure that you can factorize your trinomials. Uh, make sure that you can find the coordinates at the turning points, uh, because these are the sort of standard questions that they always, always ask us. Okay, so we've got some hands up. Okay, Bonolo and Intibuchin. Okay, Bonolo, go first. No, ma'am, it was from back then. Was it yeah, from back then? Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. No problem. Um, and Intibuchin, do you have a question? Ma'am. Yes. So, uh, okay, I think now I understand. So if x was um, 1 over 3, so then we would mean any number of like be before it would be, then it would be concave down because if the point of inflection, oh, okay, okay. 
Yes, exactly, exactly. So if you pick any x value that's smaller than minus one over three and you sub it into your second derivative, you're always going to get a negative answer. And the smaller your value of x, the, the, the more negative your answer is going to be, okay? Because the graph gets more and more concave down as that arm moves down to negative infinity. Oh, I struggled to understand because I took the the negative one over three as like the x for the twenty. That's where my ah uh, yeah. So so here yes, because this this is the graph. The way the graph is sketched is also a little bit misleading, um, because it really does look as though zero and twenty is the point of inflection, but it actually mm -hmm. isn't. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. So, so yeah, the point of inflection is not where x is equal to zero, it's where x is equal to minus one over three. So that's why because zero is bigger than minus one over three, that's why we can say that the graph is concave up where x is equal to zero. Okay. All right. Uh, let's carry on then. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move these questions down. Let's just bring it down and grab this one as well. Okay, so let's have a look at this one first. So this is also from a DBE paper. And I thought that... <clears throat> Question 8.4 would be a nice question for us to do together. We have to solve simultaneously. But when I looked at question 8.3, I thought, oh, that's also a nice question for us to do. Okay, so question 8.3 is one of those questions in calculus where they're expecting us to find the derivative using the power rule. Okay, so if you recall from last time, what are the three things that we need to get rid of before we can differentiate, before we can derive? What are the three things that need to go? Can you guys remember? What are the three things that need to go before we can derive? Roots, fractions, absolutely. and brackets, good, okay. So square root fraction and brackets, beautiful, lovely, 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 lovely. Okay, so as far as question 8.3 is concerned, we are not gonna write dy over dx, okay? Because we are not deriving yet. We're still preparing the statement. So here we're gonna write x to the power of three over two. So remember this is a square root. The guy on the outside or the guy at the bottom gets kicked to the outside of the party. Okay, so that's why the two is at the bottom. And then we're going to remove this divide line over here by writing our five and x to the power of negative three. I hope you are all thinking that way as well. Okay, now are we ready to derive? Yes, because we can see the coefficient. We've got our variable in the numerator and we can see what our exponent is. Okay, so now we are ready to derive. We've got to do that first. And now to tell the person marking our work that we are deriving, we're going to say dy over dx. Okay, and this is what we were doing earlier, Bonolo. Okay, we're applying the power rule. So I'm taking the exponent and I'm multiplying it by the coefficient. So 3 over 2 times 1 is going to leave us with 3 over 2. I'm going to write down my x, and then I've got to take 1 away from my exponent. So now my exponent is going to be 1 over 2. I hope you're all thinking that as well. Okay, so Hangwaniba, it's coming from the root. Okay, so over here, remember we were given the square root, whoopsie, I'm the wrong pen. We were given the root, the square root of three cubed. Okay, so if I want to write that rather than as a third, as, a, as with a rational exponent, it would be x to the power of 
3 over 2. If you had something like this, if you had the fourth root of x to the power of 3, then it would be x to the power of 3 over 4. Okay, so we are dividing our exponent by our root, whatever our root is. Okay. So we've done the first term, now we're going to do the second term. But no, Lord, you see how I've stopped? I didn't go and write minus. So you're going to write the sign, you're going to write your coefficient, you're going to write your variable, and you're going to write your exponent. Now you're going to stop, then you're going to go back to your expression and you're going to say, okay, the sign here needs to be a positive because a negative times a negative is a positive. Three times five is 15. Okay, and now we've got to take one away, not add one. Take one away exactly in table thing. So this has to become negative four. You are allowed to leave your answer with negative exponents. Okay, so we are allowed to leave our answer like that. I suspect with this one, there would have been a mark on that exponent, a mark on that term, and then CAs on those. Okay, Bonolo, ask your question. Yes, that's correct in Kateko. Good. Well done. So, and then the 15 comes from negative 3 times negative 5, right? Yes. Yeah. Then the, the negative 4 comes from that invincible negative 1 that should be in the exponent. No, so the negative four comes from taking one away from minus three. So you're saying minus three minus one gives me negative four. Yes. Oh, oh, man. That's what I meant. Okay. Yes, that's what you're doing. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Does that make sense? Good. All right. Good, 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 good. I'm glad. And Table King, did you want to ask something? Ma'am, mm. the 15, um, can it also be written as 15 over x to the power of 4? It can. It can. Quite right. Quite right. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, if you want to write it that way, you can, but you're not going to lose any marks for writing um, something with negative exponents. Okay. Well, not in the calculus section anyway. Okay. Um, oh, it's a pleasure, Sai. I'm glad you're enjoying your lesson. That's wonderful. We don't have much time left, but I'm so glad that you've enjoyed it. Uh, let's just see what my lead is. Ma'am, would my answer be wrong if I decide to take the x with a negative exponent to the denominator? Absolutely not, Naledi. So if you wanted to write your answer as um, 3 over 2x to the 1 over 2, plus 15 over x to the power of 4. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, the lady, you'd be allowed to do that too. You don't. You don't, uh, Horsi, sorry, Horsi. Okay. Do we have time for 8.4? I'm so glad, Fahin. It's a pleasure. Pleasure, Naledi. I know we're running out of time, aren't we? Um, Naledi, ah, uh, Naledi. Naliswa, what should I do? Should I quickly try and do 8.5 or are we just not going to have time? I, I don't think we're going to have time. And you also oh. do the 